Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, uh, next part of our popular culture series is film. So I want to do the one on publishing first because it gives you the uh, sort of contrast. This is what the film industry is trying to avoid, is what the publishing industry uh, experiences, and I hope that will become clear as we go along. And to understand the film industry, I just want to give you an example from a contemporary, very, you know, just this summer example, and that was um, Indiana Jones 5. Um, and this is a movie that, a uh, big, big budget movie, big star released by Disney, and it was not a good movie, apparently. Critics were like very meh on it, not very good, they weren't very excited. Fans were a little more, you know, like, okay, it wasn't that bad, it wasn't terrible, but it certainly wasn't, you know, world beater. It'll probably make its money back, of course, but um, nothing, nothing too exciting. And so when you think about this, you go, all right, so here's a movie, not that exciting. People, some people saw it, you know, it did okay domestically, but, but again, nothing, nothing great, all things considered. Um, so you go, okay, it's released, people see it, it goes away. What difference does it make? Ah, here's the strange thing about the theater industry, which is a model like we've talked about, um, of what they're trying to do, what popular culture industry generally tries to do, which is constrain what you can experience so that they can take your time, and then they can control that and they can monetize that. I keep repeating this, but again, it's, it, it creates these weird structures that, that we tend to uh, misunderstand uh, in our world, and it affects the, what we're exposed to, as we'll see in this case in film. So, when it was released, uh, Indiana Jones 5 was in 4,600 theaters in the U.S. Now, this is the U.S. theater industry that I'll be focusing on. Uh, so, 4,600, that is exactly how many theaters there are in the United States is a tough call. Uh, is, you know, you'll find numbers around 6,000, 5,000. Um, how many of those are independent and actually even able to show a big run movie, you know? So... Again, numbers hard to track down uh, exactly, but there's about 55, 56, 5,700 theaters in the United States that could potentially show something like Indiana Jones. Probably not even that many, but we'll go with that. Uh, and it was opened in 4,600 theaters, according to Box Office Mojo. Now, that is an extraordinary number because that means that in the United States, it was in about 80% of the theaters in the country were showing this one film. Um, second, this is not the number of screens, because a lot of these theaters, in fact, most of them are multiplexes, which means it has many screens, 4, 8, 16, whatever, um, and it would have played on, on several screens. So even if it averaged only being on two screens per multiplex, it means that it was in 80% of the theaters and on about 25 to 30% of the available screens in the country on its opening weekend. So think about that. How is it that this film that no one has seen, nobody knows whether or not they like it, um, is all of a sudden in every screen all over the country all at once? Whether or not people want to see it has no impact, right? No one has seen it yet. There's no, like, who knows whether or not people want to see it. Turns out people sort of want to see it, but not that many. So you go, okay, so big promotion, big box office, okay, they try to promote it, so it doesn't do very well. Well, all right, fine. So it was in a bunch of screens, it didn't do very well. Um, so of course, they pulled it out and put something more popular in that people wanted to see. Of course, if you're paying any attention to this series, you know that is exactly what did not happen. Five weeks later, um, it was still in over 3,000 theaters. Hard to get a count on screens, but uh, it was in over 3,000 theaters which is to say it's still in over 60% of the theaters, was still in over 60% of the theaters in the country, even though at that point, really, no one is going to see it. So 60% of the theaters in the country were showing a movie that no one was going to see. I mean, just it was making no money. So that's weird. Why would theaters show a film that no one is going to see? Because, of course, theaters don't make money if people aren't buying tickets and buying popcorn. Uh, basically, it's all about the popcorn and the Coke, of course, um, and constraining uh, audience uh, 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 choice again. Yeah, what, how is that? How does that work? All right, so here's the deal. It, in the film industry in the United States, what used to happen is major films would be released in major markets, a few theaters, maybe 
few hundred, maybe if it was really, really a major exciting thing, maybe close to a thousand screens, but that would have been a lot back in the day. And then people would see it and word of mouth over time would generate interest. And so then other theaters would pick it up and then more theaters and more theaters would show something. And so films tended to be in theaters for much longer runs and there tended a lot of the promotion tended to come from uh, word of mouth, critic reviews, people telling their friends, people wanting to watch it a second time or a third time because it was such a good movie. And then if it didn't do that well, well, other theaters just wouldn't pick it up. The film would vanish, and that would be that, fairsy squaresy. This is not what has happened. We've had consolidation at every level in the, in the film production distribution market, and it's best to think of them as a single company because essentially they operate as a single entity, even though there are several players here. Uh, five... Uh, major theater chains own the vast majority of theaters in the United States. And so when we're talking about how this works, we're really talking about them. And the deal the production companies like Disney has cut with the theaters is to say, hey, if you want to pay Disney movies, which of course you do if you're a theater chain, because Disney puts out a lot of uh, very successful movies. By the way, notice it's Disney again. Um, then what you have to do is agree to A, accept our movies, like, you have to play them. You don't have a choice. And B, you have to agree to play them for a certain amount of time. Even if they're not successful, you have to keep them in your theater for five weeks or six weeks or eight weeks or something. And this does a couple of things. One, it means that the theaters are filled mostly with production from the major movie companies because the theaters have no choice. So if you figure, oh... The uh, major, there's let's say eight major releases every summer, um, and each of those major releases is going to be on several thousand screens, and each of those major releases has contracts with the theater companies that require them to show them for weeks and weeks and weeks, regardless of how successful they are. What this means is at any given time, the vast majority of screens in the United States are controlled by a very limited number of major production companies who have these distribution agreements with the major theater chains. And the logic here is to achieve the opposite of what has happened in the publishing or what is, what is going on in the publishing industry, although there's been a bunch of consolidation in the publishing industry as well. But the idea is if any given weekend a certain number of people go, hey, let's go to the theater, let's go watch a movie live or live, do you call it movie live? Let's go to the movies. And Let's say that's a thousand people. If there's a hundred screens near you and those hundred screens are playing 50 movies, well, that means you have a, a lot of choice and the chances that you're going to pick my movie to watch are relatively small. Now, if it's a big blockbuster, hey, I'm going to get a fair percentage. But still, if you have a lot of choice, that tends to distribute the market, which is, of course, what happens in the publishing industry. Lots of books out there, so any particular book is not going to sell as many. So when all the theater, the vast majority of theater chains are controlled by this very small number of people in production studios, then what happens is they constrain that choice. So if you go to a theater, you go, oh, I want to see a movie. What's playing near me? Ah, 80% of them were playing uh, Indiana, an Indiana Jones film from Disney. And that is uh, tied to massive marketing budgets. So if you're the kind of person who watches movies, you're probably exposed to the relentless marketing, relentless marketing. So we build a huge marketing budget so that it kind of pushes you this direction and create an environment where there's only maybe four or five movies in the theaters near you that you've ever heard of. And so this increases the likelihood that you're going to go, well, you know, I keep hearing about this Indiana Jones movie. I saw it when I was a kid. I'll go see it. So you go see it and you go, well, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great. That, that's good enough for Disney. I mean, Disney would love for you to think it was the best movie ever made and come five times. But you went and you watched. And so they went. So their goal is to constrain your choice promote and market like crazy so that if you decide you want to go to a movie, the chances that you will go to see their movie are super high. As opposed to being in an environment 
where there's 50 or 100 movies playing, the chances, even with decent promotion, that you'll pick their movie, relatively low. And essentially, there is collusion both amongst the distributors and the, and the theaters and the production houses. But this is why, generally speaking, you don't have similar big-budget movies released on the same weekend, because they're trying to capture that first market before anybody knows whether or not it's a good movie, because once people find out, there tends to be this massive drop-off to the second weekend. Um, sometimes it's you know 60% less in the second weekend, which means people heard about the movie, their friends went and saw it, and they're like, yeah, don't bother. And like, okay, I'll go see something else. Oh, look, there's a different blockbuster the second or third week. And so this, the, the, the release schedule is actually carefully gamed by the major production houses so they aren't diluting their markets against each other. Occasionally they'll go head to head. It's always interesting, but most of the time they're carefully spaced out so that, hey, not too much competition again. Competition, bad. Constraining choice, good. And so this is why for major budget movies like this, the Indiana Jones, like from Disney, the, the marketing budget will be as large or larger than the production budget. And in fact, as we'll talk about in a moment, if you really think about it, the, 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 part, the marketing budget is much larger than the production budget for some reasons I'll go into in a second. So if a movie costs $150 million to make, major budget uh, release, then it's going to cost you know, 100 to $150 million in promotion, at which point you should be getting suspicious, right? If something is really good and people hear about a great movie and there's great word of mouth and the reviewers love it, people will go see it. You really don't need that. So the whole system is game to get people to go see a movie before they know whether or not they like it. Because chances are, if they have a lot of choice and they find out about a movie, they're like much less likely to go see these particular films. And so again, is this constrained choice um, and uh, to, to increase the profit margin, of course, because you have a captive audience at this point. Now, it is expensive, and everybody talks about all this money on marketing. Why would they do this? Well, again, it, it is why I, I mentioned before, they're not trying to make a little money. They're trying to maximize profit. And what they've decided, uh, for good or ill, is that if, if we can put you in a constrained choice environment, um, we're going to make much more money over time than if we actually have to compete in an open marketplace. So tie up all the theaters, force them to play the movies on, on screens, whether or not anybody's going to watch them. Um, and reduce the competition in this direction, and then flood the marketing so that reduces your exposure to other possibilities. Simultaneously, these companies, the, the, the theaters, have, generally have a lot of rules. Not only do they have to keep the movie for longer than they would probably like, uh, ideally, but they're not allowed to show other films. So there's all these barriers that are put in place to keep like small independent films out of these big name theaters. And these barriers are put in place by the big companies like Disney. They're like, hey, you can't show a film in a theater that's going to show a Disney film if it hasn't received an MPAA rating, which is the American Movie Association rating thing, which is this independent company that basically exists to keep foreign movies out of the American market, is one, one way to think about it. Um, but it creates a cost barrier. No one understands. There is no clear guidelines from the MPAA about anything, so they never know what the ratings are going to come out as. And it's just a way to create another barrier. So your local, let's say if you have a local fourplex or eightplex or sixteenplex or whatever, one of these theaters, if you've ever wondered why, hey, why don't they just have one or two screens that are always playing these weird, you know, weird movies that nobody's ever heard of just because they'll get a few, you know, people who are interested in that kind of thing answer because there's actually very clear guidelines in the contracts they sign with uh, with the major production studios that prevent them from doing that so this is why independent theaters tend to be in a bind often not universally there are ways around this it's all negotiation a few small theaters pull this off but um, often there are very tight rules about uh, you know what you can and can't show next to or at the same time as a Disney film is playing in your theater and so, again, this creates another barrier, reduces diversity in the theater, constrains consumer choice, increases profit. And this has been going on, by the way, for a long time. Consolidation in the movie industry started in the 70s at least and has been rolling along uh, merrily ever since. But if you go back a little bit in time it, to, to the DVD, if people, DVD is still around, um, but when DVDs first came out, uh, studios are like, great, now we can sell movies again, right? VHS sell movies again, DVDs sell movies again. 
but they realized they had this problem. And the problem was, if you want to sell, and this is a totally legal, 100% copyright, perfect disc, actually produced by the licensed people, so this is not piracy in any way. But if we want to sell uh, a movie in, say, India, the cost that we can charge there is significantly less than the price that we can sell a movie for in the United States. So if we want to sell a DVD for $20 in the United States, well, $20 in India is a lot more money. So we're going to have to charge a significantly lower price. But this is a totally copyright, you know, legitimate item. So, so how do we deal with this? Because otherwise what will happen is people in India will simply sell uh, DVDs in the United States for a lot less and undercut the market. So they came up with DV on DVDs what they called regional encoding, which means that the, the, the world was divided up into regions and only DVD players for your region could play DVDs that were manufactured for your region. Now, this was not anti-piracy. This had two effects. One, it protected margin so that uh, films, in, if that again, the Star Wars movie made in India couldn't be played in the United States. The exact same movie from the same producers could be played in the United States if you bought it here. So it was a way of protecting margins in different international markets. Also, it prevented films that were made in India from being imported in the United States and for people to watch them. So again, it was this attempt to uh, tightly constrain choice. All the cinephiles, of course, the people who liked European theater and all this, immediately just got these uh, what they called universal DVD players that would play a DVD from anywhere in the world so they could watch foreign movies or British films or you know Italian, whatever, Chinese cinema, whatever they're interested in, Bollywood. Um, so there was you know technological workarounds. But again, the entire industry from manufacturing DVD players to the way DVDs were made, the way they were licensed, the way they were distributed was shaped by these major production houses to prevent people from being able to play films from other parts of the world in other parts of the world. It's kind of crazy when you think about it, but again, constrained consumer choice. And so this model of uh, how, how do we make this work is you know, consistent. Like we see this over and over again, because again, otherwise it destroys the margin. What does it do to popular culture though? Uh, and again, to the film industry. And we'll talk about streaming in a second, because I know this is important. So one of the comments I got um, from, from several people concerning the one on publishing industry, they're like, yeah, yeah, you're talking about the film industry, just the box office, but there's DVD sales and you know cable TV and then eventually TV and streaming, and that generates a bunch more money as well. And I was like, yeah, that's true. This, this is true, it does generate a bunch more money, but not that much more money. Notice it's still, publishing is still huge but you don't hear about it. Well, because of the structure of um, the movie industry currently, particularly in the United States, marketing is for these films is billions and billions and billions of dollars a year focused on a very few products. And this distorts any sense because you're just gonna be inundated continuously with this feed. If you're interested in movies at all, you're just gonna get this continuous inundation of advertising and marketing that's directed towards you to try and convince you to go see, you know, one of these movies. And if you go, ah, I just want to see a movie, I tell you, it's, you know, what are the chances one of these are going to be in there? 100%, right? They're always in the theater. You're never going to go to the theater and see uh, 10 movies listed that you've never heard of, which is weird, right? Or maybe nine, maybe one. Oh, that's a big one I've heard of. Oh, here's some, here's some ones I could think about going to see. No, this is not how the industry is structured or how it wants to work. And so it has this bizarre effect, which makes people think that they hear a lot about film. They're hearing a lot about movies all the time, uh, but they really aren't. What they're doing is they're hearing a lot about 2% of the industry or 3% of the industry, like all of the films made all over the world, masterpieces being made. Film is just another art form, another great uh, uh, you know, expression of human capacity and dynamism and creativity that combines all kinds of elements. So wow, what an amazing amalgamum of, of, of so many elements into this incredible art form. But you don't hear about that. What you hear about is this incredibly narrow segment, 
So you don't tend to hear about European films or African films or Japanese films or any of this. Every once in a while it breaks through, like Miyazaki, you know, he kind of broke through there. But even that, to a limited degree, shockingly narrow. And there's no evidence that it's not because people don't want to see these films. It's because the industry is structured in such a way to make sure you don't hear about them as much as possible. Uh, and that your uh, chance of being exposed to them is as limited as possible. And as we move towards streaming, you can think about it, the same exact model has worked out in streaming. So again, if you go back to CD and DVD days, um, a, a local, even mid-size uh, DVD, CD or DVD rental place, when these existed, would have thousands of titles. If you were in a mid-sized town that had a good one, you would have you know, a 10,000 title or a 15,000 title. And every mid to large city in the country had one or two or three that were just you know, 50 or 100,000. Like they just had these incredible collections from all over the world. And you could go in and you could just get anything. Think of it as like a really, really massive bookstore for people who love movies. Now, when Netflix started pre-streaming, um, they were a DVD delivery service. And so they had a massive catalog of 70, 80, now that's over 100,000 titles that they have available. So overall, think about that. You could choose from 50, 60, 70, 100,000 titles, all the great works from all the great directors, history, but you sort by country, you know, whatever you're interested in, they were trying to deliver it to you and make this available. So that was how Netflix got started. And then they switched to streaming. Um, and in the streaming model, what they rapidly discovered is what we talked about with the theater model. What people theoretically would like all this diversity and choice, but eh, in practice, they don't have to deliver it. And so they don't. What they've worked out is they have to deliver just enough to you so that you will keep their subscription to Netflix, which is different. This is an entirely different metric. If I, if I can get any film I want from a big theater or from a, I mean, from a big rental agency or order it online from Netflix to be delivered from me, this, this is, gives me a huge broad category to choose from. So what Netflix worked out was like, oh, I just need you, when you sit down and say, I want to watch something, I don't have something you want to watch. That's too much work. That's too many titles. That's going to cost too much money. I have to have something that I want to show you that you go, oh, okay, I'll watch that. Um, and I talked to my students about this. I'm sure if, I, I've never had Netflix, by the way. I had Netflix when it delivered DVDs briefly, but uh, other than that, I've never had Netflix as a streaming service. Um, but I talked to my students about this. They all have Netflix or had Netflix. And they just reported back, oh, yeah. I said, how many times have you watched the same movie again just because you couldn't find something else to watch? Like, oh, yeah, I do it all the time. How many times have you watched something that you didn't even think you wanted to watch because there was nothing else to watch? Oh, they said, did it all the time, right? They, they, they. And so what Netflix has worked out is we just need to get you, you want to watch something, and if we make it readily available, you'll just choose. You want the sense of choice more than actual choice. And so I'm going to sort and present and organize Netflix so that you feel like you're having some good selection that is for you and that you're going to like. Even though when you talk to people about it, they're like, oh yeah, there's one or two shows I like, a couple of movies I like, but man, a lot of it's just crap. You're like, well, why do you keep the subscription, right? They have this sense that, oh, well, there's something else is going to come. I do have the one or two shows I can only get on Netflix. So that means I makes it worth it to me to keep the subscription, right? This is a very important uh, kind of driver. If I have one or two things that you really love, then you'll keep the subscription just for those. I don't need to give you anything else. I need you to give you just enough else to keep you going. And th this is incredibly insidious, by the way. To me, it's insidious because you're not looking for what you want, which is great. Find what you want, watch what you want, be interested in what you are, explore the world, wonderful. You're being manipulated and driven and coaxed at every turn by Netflix to convince you that you want to watch the things that they have completely different equation. This is, this is a, an entirely different psycholo psychology. To the point where I've been you know, doing research for this, but this has been true for years, I think it is still true. Uh, like you could add things to your watch list 
on Netflix and Netflix would reorganize it. They would reorganize your watch list. It's not your watch list, by the way, in the, under these circumstances. It's what Netflix is using to convince you that the stuff on your watch list that they often put there that you did not, or they reorganize your watch list in various ways, um, is, is for their purposes, not for your purposes. So when even your own watch list is being reorganized and reshuffled and titles are being removed and titles are being added without your consent, you, you, this is how deep this goes. Also, it tends to be really difficult to search Netflix. Like if you're interested in film, if you're interested in cinema, often what you want to search by is director or you want to search by a country. Um, this is not the front presentation. This is like, oh, recommended for you, right? What recommended for you means is we have this shit that we have, and this is the closest thing we have for something you want. This is not a service to you. This is a service to Netflix to help game you. Um, and this is the continuous feedback loop. So rather than having access to over 100,000 titles, including much of the greatest or most of the great works in, in cinematographic history to select from and choose from and explore as you will because if you want to love movies and want to watch them, great. What you end up with is like, it's like the, the uh, airport bookstore. You have this incredibly constrained selection of only those publishing mass hits or dross in the case of Netflix where they're just going to fill out the corners with dross. By the way, Disney also has a streaming service. Same thing. They wanted everybody to get on the streaming service, so they said, hey, all the Disney films are going to be available. Sign up. Get on here. Watch them when you want. What did they do after about two or three months? They started pulling product off. Take it away. Nope, nope, that's not streaming anymore. Nope, you can't watch that anymore. Nope, this is gone. Nope, we sold the rights to that to another streaming service, so you can't watch it on our streaming service anymore. Again, it's, not an, it, it, it's a uh, create barriers, create a ringed garden that you have to pay to get inside, and then put whatever the absolute minimum inside that garden is to keep you there. This is, this is the model that goes, again, on and on and on. And so what Netflix wants you to do is to watch things that they have very, very low licensing fees for. So they don't have to pay anything because this is the ultimate goal is to charge a lot for things that you don't pay anything for. That's the big win. And in, in these sorts of productions, like uh, major movies, to get back to those, why do they spend so much on marketing? Why do they spend so much on these other things rather than the production of the movie? Uh, and generally one of the reasons is, A, they're cooking the book, so nobody knows really how much they're spending. B, a lot of this spending is they're spending on themselves. So Disney is renting Disney studio space from Disney to make a Disney film with Disney employees. And then they charge Disney a lot for this, and then they record these incredible budgets to create these Disney films. So some of this is uh, accounting nonsense. So I'll, I'll always take these numbers with a grain of salt. Uh, another big part of this is, and this is back to why marketing budgets are, are dubious at best, is people go, oh, why do stars get, for instance, like $20 million or some big, big budget a, a number to make a movie? I mean, what are they doing that's that important? Well, what they're doing is marketing. So this is where TV, streaming, movies all blur together and why the film industry is so iconic and so influential, even though it's, you know, not really that much bigger than the publishing industry, if it is bigger at all. Um, because, okay, if you're a TV show, and this is where we like free stuff, uh, our, our, our big name star from whatever Indiana Jones or Star Wars or, I don't know, Mission Impossible, whatever the movies are, um, like, say, Tom Cruise, if Tom Cruise is making the tour of late night talk shows, daytime talk shows, people will turn in to watch that. Um, what is he doing there? He's advertising his film. He's a marketing person. He's out advertising. Um, he, and why do people on daytime shows want him? Well, because they don't have to pay for him. So you get somebody to come on your show for free. They're there because they're marketing their movie. And they're paid to be there to market their movie. And the TV shows like him because they don't have to pay for him to be there. And then the audience is apparently interested in these people. So they show up and they're happy they get to see them. And so you have this incredible cycle where you have TV shows that are, in fact, almost entirely marketing for movies, which are then showing commercials 
during the breaks of the TV show that is in fact a marketing commercial for the movie, right? So, the, so that's why I said when you try to calculate the marketing budget for one of these films, it's really hard to know because like the, the salary the stars are getting are largely derived from their uh, uh, perceived value as marketing. It's not their perceived value as actors or actresses. It's, oh, how many TV shows can we put you on? How long? How much work will you do? Um, how many countries will you visit? You know, just et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and so these forces drive uh, the, the perception of the value of or interest in a film. And so when you talk about marketing for these films being you know, so ubiquitous and you're being flooded, they really do try to get everywhere. They try to get in the magazines, they get on the front pages and newspaper articles, uh, you know, radio. They cover all the media channels with interviews, pictures, uh, every background, pieces, everything they can possibly do so that they can, um, of course, generate that audience for that first weekend because it's all about the first weekend because the next weekends might be bad even though, as I mentioned, it'll still be in the theater five weeks later, even though no one's watching it. So th again, this creates a saturated media environment that on average really, really does influence people's behaviors. You can look at the box office receipts. This is not confusing. If you look at the third weekends for most movies, yeah, not very good. And certainly not to justify the number of screens and theaters that they're in or on. And yet, they can make enough from that first weekend or two um, to, to make this, this equation work. Because again, the other possibility would be having a 16plex that's playing 16 different movies. And the industry has absolutely no interest in that because they would control no element of this. They couldn't saturate the media environment because just like with publishing, there's too many titles, too much choice. Um, yeah, and so this sort of model that we just are assume is natural and we're just used to and this is the way things are and people watch the movies they want. This, there's no evidence this is true whatsoever. The evidence is, I always like the cereal aisle at a grocery store, is that for some reason people like about a thousand different kinds of cereals. They're just crazy number of cereals. And so given their opportunity, consumers tend to have a very wide variety of, of tastes and choice. And so that's what they'll do. But it turns out if you go to the grocery store and you want some cereal and there's only eight kinds to choose from, you know what you'll do? You'll go, ah, oh, I wish they had this or I wish they had that. Oh, I'll just get one of these eight, right? Good enough. That's, that's good enough. Uh, and, that, and this is where the marketing is because, again, we want to create a constrained consumption market. And so we've gone from a world, and this is weird because if you go back 20 years or 10 years, uh, when VHS and, and Netflix was doing deliveries and DVDs in that period, there was actually vastly more choice for most people most of the time because your local, even small to medium-sized VHS DVD rental place had more choice than you have on Netflix today by far and generally much better choice because they were motivated to have movies that people wanted to rent. Um, they were not motivated to have a bunch of crap. And then fast forward to today, and with all these streaming services that have created walled gardens around very small pieces of content, what's happened is you have less access. You have less opportunity to get these things. You, you can't just go, oh, I want to watch all of Kurosawa stuff. And this even gets more fragmented. A, a friend of mine who lives in Germany said, oh, there's this great show that I should watch called Babylon Berlin. It's on Amazon Prime. Ah, it's on Amazon Prime in Germany. I'm not allowed. I mean, I had to search so hard to try and find this. I finally was able to find it. Um, but, I, but you know, it would not let me watch German Amazon Prime. I'm like, well, why not? I pay for Amazon Prime. Why doesn't Amazon let me watch something that people in Germany can watch Amazon Prime, but people in the United States cannot watch German Amazon Prime? Also, if you, if you look at Netflix, the number of films available in different countries is very different. Also, what films are available in different countries is very different. And some was language, but why are there so many fewer uh, uh, movies available in some countries, right? Why don't they make a bunch of stuff available to everybody? 
right? And so there's all, they're always gaming the system. And the dream is, and again, to go back to Disney. So if you think of Disney World, Disney World itself, the park, uh, this is the ideal scenario where I charge you a fee to enter. And once you're inside this world, everything that you see, touch, feel, buy, interact with is mine. There's nothing else. Um, you pay a fee to pay a bunch of money for food and to pay a bunch of money for t-shirts to pay, right? It's a, you're paying a fee to charge other fees. It's, it's a remarkable achievement that Disney has. And this is why Disney is, of course, iconic here. Uh, this way, again, why do theaters put up with this kind of model? Well, if I can get people into the theater reliably, I now have them in a captured environment. It's the joke about popcorn, right? I mean, popcorn does not cost $7 for a small bucket. Uh, it costs like 12 cents for a small bucket. Um, I actually, one of the first jobs I had was working at a movie theater, and they did not keep inventory by anything except containers because there was no reason, because the most expensive thing were cups and tubs, cups for, for Pepsi and Coke or whatever, and then tubs for popcorn. That's what was most expensive, and so that's what they counted. They didn't care about the Pepsi and popcorn because they, they were essentially free. Bookkeeping-wise, they didn't track that. So as employees, we were free to eat as much popcorn and drink as much uh, soda as we wanted because they were free. <laughs> that you're like, wow, what a great business to sell free things or nearly free things to people uh, for really, really a lot of money. Uh, of course, you have to have the theater, et cetera, et cetera. So, but this again, this is the model, create captive audience, constrain their choice and, and then roll. You don't let people bring in pizza from outside because this would destroy uh, your whole marketing program. And so when you think about streaming or you think about theaters, one way to think about this, not the only way, is to ask yourself, you know, where are the foreign films? Where are the uh, documentaries? Where are all of the small indie films that are made? These are high quality things that, that you're interested in, forget me. Um, what, what is it that, that you're interested in? Why can't you explore those? Why does Netflix only have a few thousand titles, most of them dross, rather than the hundred thousand titles that they had in their DVD, DVD delivery service, which by the way, they are finally canceling. It's been running this whole time. And it's not that it isn't profitable, it's still profitable, but eh, it's just not worth it for them to bother, right? So they don't wanna bother with it anymore. So they're getting rid of their DVD uh, delivery service. And as far as I know, no one is picking up the slack yet. Hopefully someone will for all the cinephiles out there who really love uh, movies. So it, it's just been this incredible over the last 20 years constraint on what is available for people to view and how easy it is to access it rather than technology making it more readily available and easier. Of course, this discounts piracy, um, which we can talk about next time. So when you think about the publishing industry and the problem it has with there being too many titles, even though it's huge, it's over diffuse of a market. So as the popular culture impression has, it doesn't seem that important, doesn't seem that valuable. We don't seem to care about it, even though more people buy books than buy movie tickets every year. It's more books sold than movie tickets. The film industry is fighting that aggressively consolidation, monopolization, so that they can focus your attention and focus the audience on a very narrow range of titles and then flood the theaters so that those are the only titles that are there. Um, that's the strategy because they control many more of the variables that way. Otherwise, the variable is what do people want to watch? And who knows? That's a terrible thing to try to control or predict. And certainly it's way too risky to spend a couple of hundred million dollars on so they don't want to do it. So. The film industry. Thank you.